tie and get your hair cut way up high. Get yourself a lawyer, son. You're gonna need a real good one. Yes, David Whiting, he's got the suit, he hasn't got the tie, he got rid of the tie a long time ago, but he has joined you in the studio. 1300 222 774 is the number. Good morning. Good morning, Ali. Uh, last week I thought, should I do New Financial Year's resolution and start wearing a tie again? <laughs> and here we are, two days in, and I haven't got one on yet. So no, why would you? Probably, I have Did, a client anyone... who makes ties. So I have to be, you know, you've got to support your clients. Well, you do. It doesn't mean you have to wear one. Just pop well, it in your pocket. I, I have a drawer full of ties. Oh, geez. So, yes, yes. You know, most blokes do, don't they? One way or the other. It's yes. Just, it's yes, a question yes, of yes. whether you actually... I've reached the point where if it gets a food stone, food stone, I can throw it out. Yes. Oh, that's a bit fast fashion. I, I don't <laughs> buy $400 ties. Okay. okay? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you had homework. I did. Annette mm -hmm. from Ringwood East gave us a call. She owns a B&B &B. and the she had some guests who were staying and they were, and there was a police raid and uh, there was some significant damage done to Annette's property and the question was, who pays? What's the basis upon which they might pay? Um, your starting point would be have a look at the warrant. But the principle that is that um, police are uh, the the starting proposition is that police announce their attendance and seek to get entry without breaking in. But they that's something that they make an assessment at the time that takes account of uh, the risk that the person they want to apprehend might not be there, that there might be some interference with what they're trying to find, and so it's um, and if they it, announce their appearance as they simultaneously smash down the door. Yeah, but there's also things like, is there an expectation that the person inside might have a firearm? In which case you want to maintain the element of surprise. So if if all of those things work in the police favour, there is no liability to the owner of the property that they break into. Now, I then went and looked at a couple of insurance policies and the answer is if there is damage... Well, sorry... Let's say the caveat is to the extent it was necessary in the performance of the execution of the warrant. So I then thought, so so if, you know, if someone was to execute a warrant and then, I don't know, uh, throw a table over or do something mm, like that. It has to be a reasonable... Yeah, mm. a reasonable is fairly broad in the circumstances. So I then went and looked at a couple of insurance policies and the insurance policy that I looked at basically said if there was willful damage done by someone who was invited into your property and I'm wondering whether or not, then the answer is there's no claim on the insurance and I wonder whether or not whether the, whether the granting of a search warrant constituted a form of invitation. invitation, not by the owner, but by someone who was authorised to invite someone into your property. Interesting. Oh, it's a, yeah. Sounds like this needs a court challenge. Oh, well, yeah, the tin's not... Well, I suppose if the answer was if, if there was enough money involved, yes. And imagine when... You the, haven't found it. There's no precedent. You haven't found it. No, any, no. And no. then there's the question of, well, if the special operations group comes, there's going to be a lot more damage done. Mm, yes. There is. Mm. Well, there you go. So I'm not sure that we answered it, but... No, we, my, my view to Annette is, Annette, your prospects of success are remarkably slim. Yes. No, but Annette, if you do choose to pursue it, let us know how you go. Okay, okay, please. We'd, be, we'd yes. be curious to know how you go. Uh, Sunny's joined us from Werribee. Hello, Sunny. Oh, Sunny, hello. Are you there? Oh, what have I done? Sunny, can you hear me? I'll, I'll come back to Sunny. Uh, Catherine in Canterbury. Good morning, Catherine. Hi, Ali. Hi, David. Thank you for taking my call. Um, my neighbour was riding his bike and hit by a car. He fell off, he broke, broke both of his arms. The driver stopped. He was insured. My neighbour went to hospital and he's now recovering at home. The driver's insurer has offered him about the quarter of the price of his bike. Um, and he is wondering if that's something that's negotiable with the insurer. Absolutely. The other part of my question is, um, in the first week after his accident, obviously with two broken arms, he couldn't do a great deal for himself. So his fiance stayed home to look after him. Is he able to claim any of her lost time at work because she had to take sick leave effectively to look after him? Okay, let's deal with the first one. 
Uh, I got a phone call last week from someone who was fully insured uh, okay. and was involved in a motor vehicle accident and the it was a property damage claim essentially between two insurers. Um, they couldn't agree on the value of the claim, so they're actually going, taking my client to court because he's the person responsible. So uh, it's an argument between insurance companies as to the value, pre-accident value of a vehicle. So yes, it is possible for you to negotiate. Remember, however, that a second-hand bike, you know, it's like you drive a yeah. car out of the showroom, it drops in value about a, minute, yeah. about a minute later. Yeah. Well, the yeah. same applies to bicycles. So what you okay. want to do, what your neighbour wants to do, is hit Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace and those places and see whether or not he can see a bike, a comparable bike, comparable condition, and use that for the discussion with the insurer. So okay. that's the first bit. In terms of the second bit, no. Um, if if it was if the girlfriend or the partner had a special skill for which they would normally be paid and were doing it, then there's an argument that she would be entitled to get some comp to to be paid as part of a TAC claim. But where it's okay. family providing family support, the answer is no. Uh, there you go, Catherine. To pass that on to your neighbour, uh, Sunny's back. Hopefully, I've got you, Sunny. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Good morning. Uh, th thanks for me having. Um, I, uh, David, I bought a car from Marketplace uh, as a from a private person, um, but he don't uh, own the car, and the car is registered uh, registered owner is a car yard owner. So I pay to the uh, money uh, transfer money to the private account, and uh, but they are refusing to give me tax invoice and. Uh, even until date, I have no idea that whether car is transferred to my name or not. So, so, so you actually, options? so where where you're at is that you bought from a you bought from someone who sold you the car, but the car is actually coming to you from a licensed licensed motor car trader. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So I would be, I'd give them a call and simply suggest you're quite happy to take it up with the business licensing authority. Because it seems to me that's an endeavour to get around the obligations that a trader has under the Motor Car Traders Act. Okay. So, so, uh, and you, I suppose my question is really, what are you trying to get? Because you've got evidence that the payment was made. Are they are they refusing to transfer the registration? Where are you at? So apparently they are saying to me that they have transferred to my name yes he just sent me a screenshot of a of a computer but they are not providing me text invoice they are saying that because uh, it's a bought from a private person so there is no tax invoice uh, involved into that and they haven't uh, filled out the transfer paper as well you know which is uh, authorized so, by the Vic Roads. well yeah but Vic Roads, if you're a trader they do all of those things electronically so why don't you visit Vic Roads mm. and see if the vehicle Check is the registered in your name and if it is, you've got the vehicle. Yeah. Or, or are you trying to get a GST input credit? Why, why do you specifically yes, need that, the receipt? That one, specifically because I bought okay. the car on my company name and uh, I want to claim GST as well. Okay. Then the answer would be you want the tax invoice because, except it gets a bit, it gets a bit messy, Sonny, because the Motor Car Traders, sorry, the Road Safety Act, which is the legislation that creates the registration of vehicles, distinguishes between an owner and an operator. Right? Now, yep. an, an owner is the person who actually owns the vehicle and an operator needs to be an individual or company who is responsible for all breaches of road laws for that vehicle. So, yep. for example, my wife and I could buy a car together and at that stage, it's my wife and I who are the owners of the vehicle. But the Road Safety Act only allows one person to be registered as the operator. All right, so... Yep, and that's me. So if there's a problem with the car, Vic Roads comes to me. They don't talk to my wife because yep. I'm the operator and responsible. So it would be possible, although technically messy for a private individual to own the vehicle but the registration to be in the name of the of a motor car trader. But I think logically it stinks 
And I would be suggesting a in, threaten an investigation with the Business Licensing Authority. Good luck, Sonny. It's a that's an interesting case. Uh, Joe's called from Mernda. Hello, Joe. Hey, people. How are you? Pretty we good. Talk about cats. Yeah. Um, the um, council we're in has introduced new cat confinement laws. Yes, you're in Whittlesea, uh, aren't you? Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, so from August first, cat has to be con- contained, and in our case, owing to the backyard. So that means we have to make modifications. And I've looked at the, um, I looked at various things, and finally saw that I could do it reason- at a reasonable cost with um, uh, with what they demonstrate on their website. But basically, it's still going to cost a, a good deal of money. Um, can we make a claim on that, seeing as though it's the council that shifted the goalposts? No, is the short answer. It's um, They've introduced laws that they think are in the best interest of the municipality, and one of them is to ensure that cats don't get out at night, I think. So as an owner, you're responsible? So, so as an owner, you're... you're there, there's, there's no obligation at law for you to keep the cat. Now, that'll get a whole lot of calls, Joe. But, but there's no... no, no well, that's- no, no, you make the decision to keep the cat. It's kind of like, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it's like, yeah. And so, no, you have no comeback. Sorry, Joe, you just have to, I don't know. Or, or you might you might try to get the local law repealed, but your prospects are pretty slim. Uh, very slim, I'd imagine. Uh-huh. Uh, Peter in Springvale. Hi, Peter. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Um, yeah, I've got a fence question. I know David loves them. Um, <laughs> He's good at them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my parents-in-law, uh, they've got new neighbours who've bulldozed, bulldozed the existing house and now want to replace the fences. They've got uh, a 1.65 metre fence currently, just the standard suburban fence, and the new owners want to put in a 1.95 metre fence that's going to cost $5,291. Fantastic, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, which is great for the poor pensioners who have no money. Yes. So um, what... Uh, but haven't they got a wealthy they son-in-law, Peter? Uh, I wish. No, yeah. Maybe that's the other one that I okay. don't know about. Okay. But, uh, um, yeah, so what's the what are the rules around here? Can they... Um, right, okay. Well, that, well, no, my starting point, Peter, is does the fence need to be replaced? Well, it's dilapidated. You well, know, I bet you can... So the, the starting proposition is do I need a new fence? Uh, if the fence is damaged, can the fence be repaired? So could for a grand, could it be... Made good for another three or four or five years. Don't know. That will be the starting starting point. Yeah. If, if, if you get to that, if you get to the point where it needs to be replaced, yeah. Then the your your in laws contribution would be for one half of a standard fence. Okay. So define standard for me. Well, you walk around the neighbourhood. Most of them will be in the old language five point five five and a half feet. Yeah, or or uh, 1.65 metres. Um, yeah. If they are the typical fences in the blocks around your in-law's property, then mm-hmm. uh, anything beyond that comes at the cost of the neighbour. Yeah, okay. Right now, if, oh, you're, no. if your in-laws say, I'm happy with a 1.65 fence, if you want a 1.95, then that's okay, but the extra cost is yours and you do pay a significant premium for going that high. You might also ring the council and find out whether you require a building permit in your municipality, Greater Dandenong? Uh, uh, Monash. Monash. You, well, you, need, you might need a building permit to go that high. So normally you don't need a building permit for a standard fence, but 1.95 might need one, mm, so check bit, with council. More. Peter, good yep. luck. Uh, from one Peter to another, Peter and Cows. Good morning, Peter. Morning, Ali and David. Um, I have a query in relation to a medical treatment decision maker appointment and an enduring power of attorney. The medical decision maker was appointed in June 21, or I should say the document was written then, and the enduring power of attorney in December last year. And it relates to. I take it this is an enduring power of attorney for personal matters. Uh, authorise my attorney to do anything on my behalf. Okay, that I so can it's then financial do. and personal. Yep. Okay. Yep. Correct. Yep. Does does that include medical? Was it when when you say personal, I would have thought personal would include medical as well as financial. Uh, it, it you create you, 
you've got a problem I don't have the answer to because it strikes me that there are some aspects of uh, assistance provided by a medical treatment decision maker that look like they belong in an enduring power of attorney for personal matters. I, I think that the medical treatment decision maker deals solely with medical treatment. Yep. Right? And that's, that's where it sits. So I think that uh, to the extent of an overlap, the specialist would over, override the general. So you need right. to work out whether the medical treatment decision, the decision that's sought to be made is in, this, yeah. in respect of medical treatment or for something that a parent might do for a child. Right. Um, with the decision, the medical decision maker, uh, point three says, I revoke all other enduring power of attorney, brackets, medical treatment and appointment of medical treatment decision makers previously given by me. Yes. Um, does that not nullify, or oh, no, my question is, so you're, you're, the medical treatment decision maker form still has precedence? On no, no. The, the document that you're, the first document, power of attorney, medical treatment, is a document mm -hmm. that doesn't exist anymore. Yep. It got repealed by the legislation that introduced the concept of a medical treatment decision maker. Mm -hmm. So the the documents sit in parallel. There is uh, there was there was the power of attorney, medical treatment power of attorney. It got replaced by the medical treatment decision maker, and the the enduring power of attorney for personal matters. Um, is what replaced the old concept of the of an enduring guardian that no one ever signed. So can I? So just to clarify, you it's, could ha you could have two things. You could have, have a, three things: a medical treatment decision maker authorization and a power of attorney, and they could be two different people. Yes. Right. Yes. And if and, it comes and, to and, and it gets even messier because with a power of attorney you can share power. That is, it, it could be um, that that uh, Peter and his. Peter and his partner could be joint powers of attorney. They also, so they'd need to act together. They could also be have powers of attorney that allowed them to act independently of one another. But the medical treatment decision maker document is hierarchical. So yeah, there's one person. If you can't get them, you ring the second. If you can't get them, you ring the third. So it's a hierarchical structure. So Gosh. they don't share power. Right. Peter, uh, good luck with that one. Uh, a rental question from Alice in Richmond. Hi, Alice. Oh, hi. Um, good morning. I just had a question. Our tenant um, in our investment property is about to uh, break her lease, which is great. She's bought a property, um, so it's great for her. I just wanted to know, we were about to do some uh, plastering work which required her to move out for a couple of weeks. So if we do that when she vacates, um, when it comes time to do tax next year, are those days counted as the property being available for rent? Uh, yes, because it's work that's necessary as a consequence of what's gone on. So I wouldn't okay. have a problem arguing that the that the repair work, well, it's not an improvement, it's maintenance. Yep, yeah. okay, wonderful. Thank you very Thank much. You. That's a very nice, easy, simple question. Mm. Uh, Glenn in Croydon. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I have a consumer law question regarding a uh, caravan, my caravan. The uh, suspension subframe failed massively. Um earlier this year. Was it something you did, was it, Glenn? No, otherwise it would have been a, an insurance claim, but it yep. just basically collapsed. Um, the manufacturer, I finally convinced them that they needed to do something about it, so at the moment it's being assessed. Um, I think we could probably agree, me and the manufacturer, it's a major failure. Um, if if the, if the um, case is that it it doesn't become repairable, then you're clearly entitled to it. How long have you had it? Uh, I've had it since 2021. It's a 2018 van. Um, well, you, well you, can't, you can't request a refund because you didn't buy it from the manufacturer. Uh, you, well, my view is that you would have a consumer law claim on the basis that the, the that there was a difficulty that that if you like the caravan was going to fail anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but your loss would be what you paid for the caravan. Right. Not not a new caravan and not the cost of a replacement. So I can't request a refund or. A well, no. That, but technically, the refund can comes from the person you bought it from. 
Okay, not the manufacturer. Not the manufacturer. Not the manufacturer. So manufacturer. you're coming along and saying, I've got something that you've got an, a, a liability on because uh, it's been poorly made. My expectation is that... Was there a warranty with it at all, Glenn? Well, I bought it at auction, so that's another question. Is that No, no, there might be a manufacturer's auction? warranty. Uh, so well, why, why don't you is. check and see whether there's a manufacturer's warranty which which mm-hmm. exists for those for those kinds of devices, and mm-hmm. I I will have a, a, a think about it and do some research over the week and come back next week, Glenn. <laughs> Very good, uh, Jan in Baldwin. Hi, Jan. Oh, hi, hi, David. Hi, Jan. Um, I want to ask you, how do you move forward as an executor if you've got to clear the contents of a house and that there are a lot of contents? which are in boxes, um, and you've got to list the assets for probate, but your co-executor wants to do everything with the beneficiaries acting uh, in consultation as a, a group um, organising everything. And so if you go and make a start on cleaning up some of the uh, mess and um, putting things in bags ready to be sent off to um, the tip or to an op shop, you've got um, beneficiaries harping on about what was in that as bags, what are you throwing out, what have you done, what have you stolen? How do you move on from that? What does your co-executor think? Uh, my co-executor wants to run everything as a committee. That's what oh, I'll wow. say. Oh, wow. Well, it's, no, it's a committee, but it's a committee of two, Jan. Uh, I, I know I, that, I, but I, if you have a firm entrenched position with the other executor us? saying it will be a group decision, how do I move on from that? Uh, well, you could apply to the Supreme Court to get the executor removed. Is that perhaps an overkill, is it, Jan? No. No. Oh, wow, OK. <laughs> no. That, so that you've tried be, the that conversation. That would be the process, right? <laughs> right. Uh, when, so when, I'm, when I get an exe- when I appoint an executor, I go through and say, these items have commercial value, these items have commercial and sentimental value, these items have no value whatsoever, and these items have sentimental but no commercial and the aim is to come along and group the items and deal with as an executor that those items have that have a commercial but no sentimental value send them off to get sold and then try and if you like do the preliminary cut with the beneficiaries on that basis mm. and uh, and try and keep it in a timeline and, and try not to spend 20 or 30 grand to file the executor yes uh last question steve in Janjark. hello steve Hi, how are you guys? Good, thanks. Um, I've got a question around a sporting thing. You know, if the umpire hasn't called over, can the wicketkeeper still stump the batsman if he walks? Wow. I just That's almost a news question, isn't mm. it? All of the reading that I did, Steve, says that the, <laughs> board is, that the ball is live until such time as the umpire declares it to be dead. Right. Okay, right. well, that answers that question. Isn't and, it? and Steve, didn't you learn that when you were 10? No, I didn't play cricket. It's a chopping <laughs> game. <laughs> Oh, that's great. And hey, hey just on this, um, talk about uh, the battle of the ashes. I think it's it's the battle of the of the tweets, but in a very civilised way because I don't know whether you know that overnight, uh, David, the British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, uh, did make the point that he felt that the Australians had contravened the spirit of the game. And now Anthony Albanese has tweeted and he says he supports both the Australian men's and women's cricket teams along with the line in the Prime Minister's tweet Tweet, same old Aussies always winning. Oh, <laughs> so okay. not same old Aussies always cheating, as they might have had it in the hallowed halls. Well, yes, there mm. was. A, I, I did read the Times this morning, and I did see uh, yes. yeah, yeah. the Prime Minister. Yeah. The battle of the tweets. There you go. Okay, David. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Virginia. We'll see you next, next week, week. and Thanks. I'll see you a little bit later.